This is the ninth time that I've been in London since the war, and it has been two years since my last visit. As we rode through the streets of London this past week, I could not help noting the tremendous change that has come over the British people in the last 24 months. They are better dressed, better fed than any time in the last 15 years. The evidences of the Great War are almost gone. The shops are filled, and you can buy most anything in London that you can buy in New York. This great city of London, with its more than 10 million people, has been here for over a thousand years. London is not as busy and noisy as New York, nor as exciting as Paris. It actually has a small town atmosphere. There are no skyscrapers, and the streets are narrow and winding with hundreds of quaint little shops. It is the London of Chaucer, Shakespeare, Dr. Johnson, and Dickens. It is the London of great political leaders like Disraeli, Lord George, and Winston Churchill. It is the London of great military heroes like Wellington, Nelson, Sir Francis Drake, and scores of others that are household names throughout the English-speaking world. It is the London of great spiritual leaders like Tyndall, Wycliffe, William Carey, George Whitfield, John Wesley, and hundreds of others. There's something thrilling and awe-inspiring about this great city of cobblestones and ancient landmarks. However, the London of today is different than any other London of any other generation. These people on the streets are the people that endured the terrible blitz that was far more fearful than London's great fire of several generations ago. The fire of London was an accident, and it lasted a matter of days. The blitz was a deliberate attempt of an enemy to subdue a city whose watchword has always been freedom. This generation of Londoners has endured more than any previous generation. It has left a cynicism, a hardness of heart, and in the wake of the war has followed a materialism and secularism unparalleled in British history. There's a deep longing for peace within the hearts of the people. They've seen war firsthand with all of its terror, and they're sick of it. They are ready to pay any price for world peace. A member of parliament recently said that peace and security are the consuming passions of the British people. They are ready to retreat or compromise in order to obtain peace in our time. The most important word in the British language today is peace. However, it is agreed that the most elusive word of the centuries is peace. All down through history, Britain's most desired possession in all the ages was peace. However, Britain has fought more than 2,000 wars, and there's a terrible fear and the British people may have to fight another one. Here in England, Peace is the fundamental objective of the statesman, the one goal of the philosopher, and the coveted prize of the individual. Men are willing to fight for it, to endure hardship, suffering, and privation in the hope of achieving it. There are only a comparatively few in the city of London who realize that Christ is the eternal source of peace, and apart from him there can be no peace. Outside of Christ, all is confusion, discord, and disorder. He is life's integrator. He is humanity's coordinator. He is the world's great harmonizer. When Gladstone in his declining years was asked what power had kept him steady during his active, tempestuous career, he pointed to a motto on the wall which said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Deep in the heart of every man is a yearning, a longing, and a hungering for peace. That peace with God as a possibility in human experience has been proved in the exacting test tube of life itself. Hundreds can witness to the fact that he is our peace. Let us consider the matter of this peace. As we open the dictionary on the one hand to find man's definition and the Bible on the other hand to find God's meaning, the dictionary tells us that peace is rest, tranquility, and composure. First, we find that peace is rest and tranquility as related to God. Through Christ, in a personal experience with him, the natural barriers between God and man are removed. Through his wonderful atoning work on the cross, God and man were made one. And that is the real meaning of the word atonement, to merge into one again. God, of course, holds no enmity towards sinful man. His great heart contains love, compassion, and pity. And throughout the centuries, his designs have been to restore man to a place of fellowship, friendship, and amity with himself. Through the work of Christ on the cross, this harmony was affected. Christ bought, purchased, and restored this peace. Isaiah said, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Listen to what the Bible says about this accomplishment of Christ at Calvary. For he is our peace, and it made both one, and it broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. This is the message that we've come 3,000 miles to London to preach. 
It is our purpose to exalt and glorify Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. It is our purpose to declare in no uncertain terms to the people of London that Christ and Christ alone is our peace. The only reason we've come to this great city is to preach Christ and him crucified as the only hope for our lost, confused, and bewildered world. Here in London, where only 2% of the people attend church, our hearts are already filled with compassion for this great people who have turned from the God of their fathers to secularism and materialism. In their wild and frantic search for peace, they've turned from the only one who can give them peace to false go gods that could eventually destroy England. In preliminary meetings this past week, I have on every occasion announced that Christ is our peace and that peace with God through Christ is attainable in this present world. I've told them that it has been my privilege to tour the combat zone of Korea's inferno where enemy jets roared overhead and the eternal zing-zing of rifle fire was heard unceasingly. There in the midst of cold, privation, suffering and the constant threat of death, I've asked war-weary soldiers, in the midst of all this, does Christ give you peace? And they've answered unfalteringly, indeed he does. In the midst of war's confusion, Christ is our peace. In personal interviews with world leaders whose broad shoulders slumped with the weight of responsibility placed upon them by virtue of their office and whose minds reeled with the intoxication of perplexity, I've asked those leaders who had trusted Christ for personal salvation, in the midst of all this turmoil, is your faith adequate? And they've answered, yes, Christ gives peace. I've stood at the graveside with those who were not only saying goodbye to loved ones, but were burying their hopes their aspirations and their dreams, and clasping their hand, I have asked, in this dark hour, has Christ forsaken you? And they've answered, no, certainly not. He gives me peace. Everyone who has taken Christ seriously and is dared to rely unreservedly upon him has found him wonderfully adequate. There are many here in England that feel that social security will buy peace. There are others that think money can buy peace. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not social security nor the pocketbook, but Christ who has all the potentiality of peace. Trust him, accept him, believe on him, and the Bible promises that the peace of God will flood your soul. Secondly, the dictionary says that peace is harmony as related to others. The Bible says, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. To be at peace with God is to be at peace with others. This is the Christian ideal. This is a practical possibility. And this peace need not be a peace of compromise or appeasement, but a peace affected by the abiding presence of the Spirit of God. I know of countless people whose usefulness has been hampered by resentment, envy, and malice. Their nights were haunted by ghosts of hatred, and their days were filled with fears and misgivings. But through Christ being lifted up as the giver of peace, they beheld themselves as they really were, confessed their prejudices, their envies to Christ, and opened their hearts to the flood of divine peace which always follows the sincere confession of sin. Psychiatrists have discovered that if they can get people to confess their resentments and own up to an unforgiving spirit in their lives, that they experience a certain release from guilt and find a measure of peace. While the psychiatrist, for a fee, undoubtedly does a lot of good, did not Isaiah know the value of honest confession when he said, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The psychiatrist cot has replaced the mourner's bench, but the fact of sin remains the same. Before we can be at peace with our fellow man, resentment must be confessed and rejected, and sinful envy, jealousy, and malice must be forsaken. When the peace of God comes to the heart of a man, it harmonizes the home, integrates the family life, brings accord to his social relationships, and reconciles him to living an ordered, controlled life. Then and then only can a man live constructively. Peace with God is the touchstone of abundant living. Anything short of this is dire existence. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who preached to such great crowds here in the city of London, was a confused, mixed-up young man until he found peace with God. Had he not had a crisis experience with God, a yielding and surrender of ambition and pride, the world would have never had the blessing of his rich, full life. One day, while walking across a meadow on the way to further his education, a voice spoke to him. Seekest thou good things for thyself? Seek them not. He interpreted this as the voice of God, turned back, and prayerfully sought God's will for his life. He became the greatest English preacher and soul winner of the 19th century and was instrumental in helping thousands to find peace of Christ. 
The peace that God gave him was not a placid, cold, selfish peace, but it was a living peace that soothed and quieted the troubled waters of man's unrest. It was vital, real, practical, and prepared men not only to die triumphantly, but to live victoriously. Third, there is the peace that is freedom from war as related to self. The Apostle Paul once said, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Here in Great Britain among the Christians, there's a tremendous emphasis upon victorious Christian living. There is something about these wonderful Christians in England that have a depth and a knowledge of the Bible that I fear we in America do not have. While they may lack some of our evangelistic zeal, yet they have a daily walk with God that I wish we American Christians had. There are thousands of Christians throughout England that know what it means to pray and walk with God in a life victorious. Here in London at this moment, there's a great unity among Christians. Men of all denominations and walks of life have joined hands together to pray and seek the face of God during these next few weeks. There's an air of expectancy wherever Christians gather. And there are many that believe that God is going to touch London with an unprecedented spiritual awakening. One of the hard cries of Christians in London is that thousands of people outside of Christ and thousands outside of the church may know what it means to have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, which is your vertical relationship, then your horizontal relationship, your social problems, your family problems, your personal problems take care of themselves. At this moment, whoever you are out across America, throughout the world, you can bow your head and heart and receive Christ as Lord and Master and Savior and know what real peace of heart means. You that are troubled and burdened and perplexed and frustrated. You that have problems and difficulties that are too hard to bear. You that are lying upon a sick bed in a hospital today. I beg of you to turn in full surrender to Christ. And he will give you joy and happiness and peace such as you've never known. At this moment, as God is getting ready to move through Great Britain. As we begin in Haringey Arena tomorrow night. And his thousands here in Britain are going to receive Christ. I beg of you in America, receive this Christ of Calvary today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God at this moment, we pray that hundreds as a result of this broadcast will find the Christ of peace. For we ask it in his name. Amen.